Thank you. Um, so why organic seed matters and how to meet the demand. Um, I have a number of slides, and since I'm the first speaker, I felt like I needed to provide a little bit of context. So I'm going to power through those slides and not spend a lot of time on them. Um, you can read my other comments in the proceedings itself. So <clears throat> with that, um, I switch to my first slide here. Organic seed systems, you know, as all of us understand what um, the triple bottom line of sustainability um, is, the ecological help, making sure that it's socially inclusive, but also economically um, vital. And so organic seed systems, in order, in order to provide that triple bottom line, we need um, the genetic diversity that's necessary for the co-evolution of both the agroecological and the socioeconomic aspects of food and farming. And, and I'll address that a little bit as I go through these slides. So if, oops, sorry. So part of, of what we need is not only the, the diversity within particular crops, but also the diversity of crops within organic farming systems. So all of us know that if, as we further diversify the rotation, um, the uh, strength and vitality of our farming systems also increases. So part of what um, we've been doing on our farm is delving into the history of food and agriculture in our region. It really provides some invaluable insights into the diversity of crops and varieties that have been grown historically. Um, this is Oscar Will. He started a seed company. Um, he came to the Dakotas in 1881. So this was nine years before we even had an agricultural college in North Dakota. Um, in his... 19, or 1896 catalog, we see the first reference of his interest in developing regionally adapted varieties. Um, the catalog's title was Northwestern Grown Seeds and Trees, so he considered North Dakota the Northwest. Um, much of the germplasm was actually gifted to him by the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara tribes. Um, and he uh, also was called a pioneer seedsman, and the roots of the Pioneer Seed Company are in Oscar Will's um, seed company. So the North Dakota Agricultural College was established in 1890. So exploring our land-grant universities and their crop breeding history and the varietal releases that, that they um, bred provides insights into what adapted germplasm and, and what sort of quality traits they were seeking. And this exploration really can help expand our thinking about what's possible, valuable, well adapted to our region's growing conditions. Cross-referencing that with historical information, that historical information with personal stories about the crops and varieties that were grown um, in a, on our farms and in our gardens in a, in a particular region also adds another dimension of understanding. So Oscar Will was dissolved in 1960. The nursery's acreage is now under a mall. Um, this is the back cover from the 1858 or 1958 catalog, and it uh, displays Will's pioneer home collection, home garden collection. And it featured the most, the best and the hardiest varieties for a rugged northern climate was how he pitched it. And the Wills always asserted that the foundations for progress were hard work, personal independence based on home food production, and garden varieties that were developed for the region's unpredictable climate. So, you know, you think about that in, in 1958 and, and compare that to the situations we're dealing with now. So we're, we were able to obtain a list of all the varieties that had been developed by North Dakota State University. The NDSU Horticulture de Department was merged with the Plant Science Department in 1991, and so we've had a 24-year gap in plant variety development in vegetables um, on the part of our land-grant university. So... Um, 
This is Fargo yellow pear, which was actually developed by uh, a plant breeder, Dr. Yeager, who crossed bison tomato with a traditional yellow pear. And um, what's, what's particularly interesting about Jaeger is he, he worked for the college for 18 years um, and then uh, and in that time developed 21 new fruit varieties. So um, several of his varieties are still easily found today. Buttercup squash is one of them, Fargo yellow pear, and um, actually have a colleague that was able to obtain germplasm of pinky popcorn, which was another release of his, and he's bringing that back into the seed trade. So um, these are a couple other varieties that were released by NDSU uh, and, and University of Minnesota, Minnesota Midget and Gold Nugget Squash. And some of these varieties are still represented in the trade, but the challenge can be identifying the best seed stocks of some of these older varieties. And um, because they're cross-pollinated crops, um, we're finding that there's, there's issues with finding seed stocks that are true to type. So this was um, one of the varieties that was released by NDSU. It's called Double Rich, and we were able to obtain it from the USDA germplasm network. So there's, you can also obtain some of these varieties from Native Seed Search and uh, from Seed Savers Exchange. Um, this particular variety was a 1954 NDSU release, and it's celebrated as having twice the vitamin C of a regular tomato. This is Crimson Sprinter, uh, or I'm sorry, Wisconsin 55, and this was one that John Navazio actually worked on to um, do some selection work. And yesterday when we were on the farm tour, um, uh, we were at Wild Garden Seeds, and Frank Morton was talking about this, um, this we're enamored with heirloom, heirloom varieties, but he was making the comment that Heirloom varieties aren't static because if we're using them and we're making selections, you know, it's not like they were what they were um, when they were originally released. So this is Amish paste, another variety that we're working with. It's on the Slow Food Arc of Taste. And, um, oh, my slide isn't moving here. So, Part of what we need to do is, is, in order to identify varieties that do perform well in our region, is to conduct variety trials. They take an awful lot of effort, but it's so valuable, the information that you gain back from that. And so as we explore some of these um, varieties that were originally developed or utilized in our regions, conducting variety trials of not only those varieties as compared to the market standards that are out there now, but also conducting variety trials of the various seed sources that these varieties are available from, and then identifying the best possible germplasm is really critical to provide, you know, reintroducing these varieties into the seed trade. So um, the germplasm information network that I um, mentioned earlier is critical in order to provide the diversity that we may need in order to um, develop some of these minor crops and reintroduce some of the, the heirloom and heritage varieties that used to be utilized in our farming systems. This is the Northern Plains Sustainable Agriculture Society's Farm Breeding Club. And they have, um, we've been conducting emmer variety trials as well as einkorn. And all of that germplasm was accessed accessible through the USDA Germplasm Information Network. And so funding that network and making sure that we have access to that germplasm is critical in order to do this kind of work. So in the other piece of that is as we engage farmers into the Northern Plains Sustainable Ags Farm Breeding Club, for instance, we also need changing patterns of needs assessment and setting what the research priorities are. Um, Farm Breeding Club is, is a participatory plant breeding model, so we need to increase the linkages and relationships um, within uh, all along the food value chain. Uh, so not only involving farmers and researchers, but also involving the processors and, and ultimately the consumers. And leveraging that information to inform and empower people is really critical. And, and will help preserve our collective seed heritage. 
So all of us are aware of the evolving food culture and um, the linkages between food farming and health and the environment, and seed is at the nexus of that paradigm. So uh, getting back to the variety trials, providing that social inclusion where um, consumers are taking part in these variety trials and actually tasting them and providing feedback. And also um, just part of the feedback loops can be through the, the Farm Breeding Club through outreach work um, actually meeting your customers, selling your seed, uh, getting that feedback from them on how the varieties are performing, what are their issues in gardening, and what their needs are is critical to, to actually um, making the organic seed system um, relevant to them. So collaboration and healthy feedback loops, providing that targeted research reduces the cost of development and also provides for greater farmer adoption of those relevant seed varieties. So um, I talked earlier about economic vitality that if you're targeting your research and actually providing high value seed production and, and relevant varieties, then you'll have an enhanced sales which will increase the resilience of the organic farming system. So this is, this is um, a shot on our farm, uh, the, the continuing education and um, especially of the next generation of seed producers is so critical. So we need to continue to foster seed saving and seed selection and plant breeding skills within the organic seed community and within youth and the involvement of farmers as well. But the other piece that is so critical um, in order to provide um, a, a high quality seed source is seed cleaning and conditioning skills. On our farm, we, we take this very seriously. All of our varieties are run over a gravity table and seed cleaners. Um, we run all of our tomato seed through um, an air column so that we're selecting for the heaviest seed. So only the heaviest seed, the highest test weight seed goes into our seed packs. And if we want farmers to and, and gardeners to forth their money and, and pay the higher cost for organic seed, we need to make sure that they're getting high quality. So part of that is also having a stock seed program. And this, I think, is one critical piece that's missing in organic seed systems. Um, the actual stock seed systems where you're going through and your first picking is selecting the very best plants. The, the, if, if one of your criteria is selecting for earliness, um, going through and, and identifying which of those plants meet your criteria and picking your stock seed first before you harvest your production seed. So this is a critical aspect. And as a seed producer, I can't tell you how many times where I've been contracted with organic seed companies to grow a particular variety, receive the stock seed of it, grow it out, find that it's not true to type. And now I'm in a breeding and selection process instead of producing actual seed. So um, this is just one of our, a couple of our varieties that, that we're actually maintaining. We, we maintain stock seed on all of our varieties, but every one of them have selection criteria. And so we go through and, and make our selections based on that criteria. So um, like I said, I, I really think that's a critical piece that's missing in our organic seed systems. And so if, if we want that resilience and that adaptability, that selection and that stock seed work is, is absolutely critical. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you.